Well, imagine for a moment, two people walk into a place of worship, and when they walk in, they experience what all of you experienced when you walked into Pathways Church for the first time. The question, when you walked into our auditorium, at the top of your mind was simply this, where are we going to sit? Now, friends, that's a really important decision. And here's why. The moment that you select the seats in which you sit in, they become your seats, okay? Heaven forbid somebody else walks in and takes your seat. There are like alarm bells that go over. It would mess with you. It would mess with me. I mean, I'd get up here. I'm up here every week and I know, oh, yep, that's where they're gonna be. Yep, that's where they're gonna be. Yep, that's their seat. Yep, that's their seat. Yep, yep, that's their seat. If somebody takes your seat and I get up and I'm delivering the sermon, the message, I'm going to think to myself, whoa, 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 a second. Why are you there? No, no, that's his seat. I'm sorry, you need him a time out, right? Now, my guess is by now all of our guests are thinking, did I take somebody's seat? (laughs) Which, by the way, if you're new, if you're our guest, hey, uh, we're so grateful that you're here. We have something after service called Newish. Make sure you stop by, talk to somebody out of Connect. You don't need to register, bring your kids. It's a way for you to get to know us a little bit more. And speaking of seats, you won't want to miss next weekend. Next weekend, I'm going to be casting some vision for our ministry year. And I believe that God has laid some things on my heart as well as the hearts of our staff and elders. And we're really excited just to share with you what God is doing. And we believe that our best is in front of us. And so make sure you're here with us next week. It's great to see all of you this uh, weekend, this Sunday. And uh, can we give it up for our online church family? Because uh, they're with us. You matter. You're important to us. Thank you for joining us online today. Well, James has this to say to us in regard to people walking into places of worship. He says this in chapter 2, verse 2. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, oh, here's a good seat for you, but You say to the poor man, you stand there or you sit on the floor by my feet. James says, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? James says, suppose you see two people walking in to the synagogue and you spot one of them who has money and one who doesn't. How do you know? Well, you just look at the way they're dressed. That's how you can tell. So as a result of their appearance, you treat them differently. It's the sin of snobbery. It happened back then, and it happens today. Well, we are continuing with our study of the book of James as we begin a brand new sub-series called Faith in Action. And faith works because faith goes to work. It's faith in in action. And here in chapter two, James begins to make a turn. He begins to deal with how faith in our hearts leads to faith through our hands, our actions. Now, let me just backtrack for a moment and let's uh, look at verse one of chapter two. Here's what James says. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, they must not show favoritism. Let's just pause there for a moment. What James is saying is that authentic faith in Jesus makes a difference in who you are and how you live. Specifically, James is talking about how we should display lives of compassion by treating people differently as a result of our relationship with Jesus. You know, a good friend of mine, John Parrott, uh, he says it this way, that Christians are common people living uncommon lives. That's who we should be, common people living uncommon lives lives. So in the very first 13 verses of chapter two, James writes about how we should treat people because we read the command, one of the 59 commands in this five chapter letter written by James, we read this command. We must not show favoritism. Favoritism, or in the language of our culture, discrimination has no place among God's people. Favoritism, partiality, discrimination, unacceptable. Let it not be found at Pathways Church. Amen? 
Apparently, though, this is being done in the first century. How do we know this? Because if it wasn't, James wouldn't be addressing the issue of favoritism among God's people. So he speaks on it. And that's why he begins chapter two by setting up this scenario of this picture of two people who walked into the synagogue for the first time to find a seat. Now, here is the bottom line, the point of the passage. James says it this way. If you want message notes, you can go under uh, 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 this weekend, find the message notes on our mobile app. Or if you're jotting notes down, here's the point of the passage. Wealth itself does not deserve honor. Wealth itself does not deserve honor. Now, why does this need to be stated? Well, because so often this is what happens, doesn't it? I mean, think about it in our culture today. Wealthy people get special treatment. Wealth receives special treatment. Now, bear in mind, if you've been tracking with us throughout this sermon series, this is not the first time that James raises this issue. If you go back to chapter one, James talks about wealthy people in relationship to trials. He says this in verse nine, he says, believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. In other words, if you're poor, take pride in your high position spiritually. But the rich should take pride in their humiliation since they will pass away like a wildflower. Translation, listen, don't keep track so closely of your bank account when trials come because money has a way of disappearing. Now let's consider the context as James needs to hit this theme of wealth again. Contextually, here's what's taking place. If you remember, his listeners are a group of Jewish people. They're hated by the Jews because they believe that Jesus is the Messiah while other Jews are still looking for the Messiah. They're given the side eye by the Gentiles because they're Jews. In effect, all they have is just one another in terms of how they're gonna make it through this trial. And what's the trial? Persecution. If you remember, they're on the run. They're scattered. They left Jerusalem. They had to pack all their bags. Their businesses are closed down. They're taking their families and they're trying to figure this out. Simply put, these believers are in need, in financial need. So someone who is wealthy walks into their place of worship. What's the temptation that's gonna be running through the minds of these believers? Yeah, they're, they're gonna be thinking, how can we give a good experience to this wealthy individual? Because if they have a great experience here at the synagogue, they're gonna what? they're going to return. And if they return, the temptation would be, man, they would potentially share their wealth with us. It's a very real temptation. Well, if a poor person walks in, poof, we already got a room full of poor people here. You go stand there, sit there. We don't really care about you. That's kind of the context of what's taking place among the listeners of the day. And, and to understand this at an even deeper level, from a socioeconomic status, I was reading one commentator and it said that there were about 8% who were wealthy during the first century. So there was about 90% who were poor. So assuming that the vast majority of the listeners of James' letter, they were poor and there was only about 2% that could kind of climb the social ladder, if you will. So by and large, once you were in a, a particular uh, socioeconomic demographic, you were in that, in that class, that's where you remain for the rest of your life. It's a very real temptation to show favoritism or to discriminate against those who were either wealthy or those who were struggling. So James, as I mentioned, basically lifts up this application and he says, wealth itself does not deserve honor. That's what James is saying. But let me tell you what James is not saying, okay? This is very important. James is not saying treat everyone the same. He's not saying that since everyone is equal in the eyes of God, everyone deserves equal treatment. That's not what James is saying. Now, for some of you right now, I just said that and you're thinking, really? Chapter and verse on that, Adam? Let's talk about that. Okay, let's talk about it. Let me give you a couple examples. Over the holidays, I was back home in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and I was spending some time with my parents. My daughters came out for a couple days and uh, we went to a particular restaurant. My favorite restaurant is where I had my first job. It was called Peachtree. Peachtree, how many of you like pancakes? Anybody like pancakes in the room? Oh man, me too, pancakes. Listen. Uh, 
Peach tree pancakes are the best pancakes your lips will ever touch, hands down. I don't know what they put in them, but they're amazing. And I don't care if it's a Tuesday morning or a Friday morning or a Saturday morning, the line is typically like there is a long wait because breakfast is amazing at Peachtree. And so anyways, we were there one particular day and the girls were with me and, and uh, the line was, we were in the, in the waiting area and we were seated there. And there was an elderly couple that came walking in, a husband and a wife, and there were no seats available. So men, what did I do? I stood up. I gave my seat to the elderly woman. Why? Because that was the kind action to do. That was the respectful thing to do. In a very small way, that's faith in action. It's showing value and it's showing preferential treatment to the elderly woman. Now, if that were an 18 year old boy that came walking into the restaurant, pff, I'm not getting up. In fact, I'm keeping an eye on him, making sure that he's not looking at my daughters. or we're gonna have an issue, okay? We've all been to airports, sitting at the gate, and we hear the attendants say, we're gonna start boarding. If you're a parent of a young child, welcome aboard. And oftentimes, they'll follow it up and they'll say, and if you are a uniformed military uh, personnel, you may board at this time as well. Which, by the way, for all of our military people, thank you so much. Thank you so much for serving our nation. Thank you. Thank you for protecting our freedoms. Thank you. So what are we saying? Because of your circumstances, if you're elderly, if you're a parent of a young child, if uh, you, you serve in military, listen, we want to give you preference. And none of us, we don't have a problem with this, right? In fact, if you're looking for chapter and verse on this, you can look at the very last verse in James chapter one, the one that precedes what we're just talking about today. Because James talks about preferential treatment. Here's what he says in verse 27. He says, religion that God our father accepts. The brand of religion that the heavenly father accepts is one that shows preferential treatment to who? To widows and orphans or orphans and widows in their time of distress and to keep one, oneself from being polluted by the world. That's why we as a church, we fund and we, we serve at Pillars. Pillars is one of our ministry partners here in the Fox Valley. And if you've never served the meal to a single mom and her children, it's a humbling experience, friends. Let me tell you, it's faith in action. In fact, if you have never been a part of that, I would encourage you, you find some of your people, your small groups and friends here at Pathways, your family, parents, if you want to engage your kids in a faith that grows, a faith that works, take some of your teenagers with all their devices and all the things that they have and take them down to pillars and rustle a meal together and say, you don't even have to say anything. Let them see what struggle really looks like. Listen, when we do that as a church family, not only are we showing preferential treatment in a way that honors God, but we're also growing our faith. We're becoming doers of the word. It's faith in action. And listen, I'm all about biblical truth. I'm all about uh, gaining resources and laying a foundation, scripture memorization and chair time. I'm all about that. That's a big deal for me. But what James is saying is that faith in action is the proof of what you believe because you can have a full head of facts and an empty pair of hands, not serving, not loving, not engaging. And friends, can I just tell you that the, there's no such thing as a non-serving Christian. That's an oxymoron. It doesn't exist when you look at the book of James and the bigger book called the Bible. Your behavior is proof of your belief. You can't just say, hey, I really, be oh yeah, I'm, oh, I'm a Godfather. I believe in Jesus, but you don't do anything about that. You're not engaging. The question that James would ask you and I would support him would be simply this. Is your faith even true? Is it really valid? At one part in the book of James, James says it this way. Even the demons believe. Big deal. You believe. Who cares? Let's talk about faith in action. This is where James is going. 
He's talking about how we treat individuals. Now, as I already mentioned, the point of the passage is simply this. James is saying that wealth itself does not deserve honor. To drive this point home, if you drop down in the next section, James, here's what he's going to do. He's going to offer up three rhetorical questions that are going to really bring to light the hypocrisy of his audience. He's going to show them that, you know what, your actions and how you treat wealthy people, I'm telling you, you're so hypocritical, it's mind-blowing, okay? This is what he says in verse 5. Here are the three rhetorical questions. Question number one, he says, listen, my brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? Let me paraphrase. Here's what James is saying. Question number one, did God play favorites when he chose you? The obvious answer, no. If God played favorites, what James is saying is, you, my brothers and sisters, you wouldn't have been included. Now, let me be clear. Does God choose the wealthy? Yes, he does. For example, if you look in the Old Testament, Abraham, he was extremely wealthy. If you remember uh, Job, Job was another uh, extremely wealthy individual. If you go to the New Testament, you can see Lydia. Lydia was one of the, uh, a modern day fashion designer, if you will, a dyer of purple cloth. She was one who was instrumental in starting the church along with Apostle Paul in the city of Philippi. She was a very wealthy woman and yet God chose her. In fact, God is a respecter of no persons. He chooses the wealthy and the poor. God shows no favorites. He chooses us all in Christ Jesus, all we must do is make the decision to lay our lives down, our needs and our desires, and to follow Jesus. Have you made that decision? That's the greatest decision you'll make with your entire life, to follow Jesus. Okay, here's the second rhetorical question. Verse 6, James says, But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? In other words, James is saying the second rhetorical question, do not the wealthy use their wealth against you? Just like today, who can afford attorneys? Wealthy people. And what James is saying to his audience is simply this. It enrages you as poor people when the wealthy drag you into court and take advantage of you. And yet, when a rich person walks into your synagogue, you do the very same thing. You show them preferential treatment, just like the justice system does in your cases. How asinine is that? That's ridiculous. What are you thinking? Here's the third question. Verse 7. Are they not the ones referencing the wealthy? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? Question number three. James is saying, my words, not his. Do not the wealthy look down on you for following Jesus? You know, wealth back then, as it is today, is seen as a status symbol. It's a status symbol that gives a sense of security and lessens the need for God because money becomes a God to individuals who have lots of it if they're not careful. And just to be clear, by the world standards, most of us in this room and watching online, let's just kind of clear this up. You're wealthy. Out of the 7 billion people in our world today, half of the individuals live on less than $2 a day. By American standards, the Department of Health cited that really the poverty line that we will talk about in politics, really that is a family of four who makes less than $30,000 a year. For most of us, we make more than that. We're not poor. People from other countries they would die for the opportunities that we get here in the United States of America. And if we're not careful, we can have the attitude that I'm better than you. Or we can get into social media and see everything that's happening on blogs and websites and TV shows. And we can think, I'm less than this individual because they have more than me. Here's the scariest attitude and reality of all. We might get to a place where our personal income and our bank accounts and our stacks lead us to a place where we say, you know what? I'm not sure I really need God. I got all the protection and security I need. Friends, that's dangerous. 
If that's you today, please listen to me. Listen, do not fall into the trap. Do not worship the God of money. James is stating very openly the heart of God when he says to us as believers, do not show favoritism. And oh, by the way, this is not a new idea. It's not a new idea. God's been talking about this idea of not showing favoritism or partiality. In fact, that was his very character. Back in the Old Testament, he had designed his nation, the children of Israel, that when they would make their fields, when they would uh, farm, they would always leave the outer edges for those foreigners who would pass by. Why? Because he wanted them to be cared for as well. God was always into making sure to distribute and to care for people. In fact, uh, uh, who said these words? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Who said those words? It's not a trick question. You can say Jesus. Jesus. Oh, good. Okay, let's try it again. Who said these words? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and, and love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, good, 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 good. Some of you are like, was he giving, was that like, what was he doing right there? I mean, just, just a question. But Jesus was just quoting, you know this, from the Old Testament. That's what God had established with his people in Deuteronomy chapter six. Also in Leviticus 19, the book that you never read in the Old Testament. Yeah, that one. God also talks about this, that he doesn't show favoritism. That we're supposed to love our neighbor as ourself. And so here's what James is doing. He's simply picking this theme up again and he's restating and he's saying, listen, you need to make sure you treat people as followers of Jesus. Don't play favorites. Don't mess around. But my concern as your pastor is this. We can hear a message like this one and we can think this. We can think like, I got it. I'm good. I got it. I already got it, Adam. I understand. Makes sense. I got it. And we don't consider the depth of our actions, especially in the culture and the context that we live today. Listen, friends, we become so PC that we're so aware. We're on high alert. Can't say anything. Don't want to do anything. This could be recorded. This could be on X. This could be, I mean, all of a sudden, like we are, we can get all the actions right. But here's my concern as your pastor. Your heart can be messy. It can still be discriminatory. It still can play favorites. Listen, this message is about checking your heart and monitoring within. So what does this mean for us? It means that we recommit ourselves to the values that we've established as a church. One of the top values of our church is simply this, that all people matter to God. All people, all people. You know the word that trips you and me up, trips me up, is the word all. It's not people who just vote like me, look like me, think like me, dress like me, uh, speak like me, eat like me, work like me, worship like me. Not just those people, all people. The people who don't vote like me, think like me, look like me, dress like me, make they, those people too. Christ died for them. He loves them. If we value all people because we know that God values all people, then that communicates a statement of God's love, his care, his mercy versus his judgment versus a sense of being self-righteous or legalistic, which God's not into. So let me ask you, is there anyone in your life that doesn't matter to you? I think, oh, Adam, what are you talking about? Yeah, like a, a group of people that when you see them, you don't, based on some external thing, you don't really... You're not sure if you like them. Well, no, Adam, I love every. Let me ask you, do you pray for that group? Oh, come on now, Adam. Now you're in my business. Yep, I am. Because I think that's what James would say. He'd say, let's make sure that we're treating people with respect and dignity, even when we disagree with them. Even when we don't understand what's going on. Why? Because they were created in the image of God. Or maybe, let's get a little bit more personal. It's not necessarily a group of people. It's someone who's close to you. They've hurt you so much. You're so angry and resentful. You've built up walls inside of them that if you were honest, you would say, you know what? They don't matter. In fact, I've prayed for them. But if you heard some of my prayers, Adam, it wouldn't be good. James is saying, he's asking this question. 
Who doesn't matter to you? Whoever that is, you got work to do. Second question, application for us as we go through this week is simply this. How are you treating people these days? I had two experiences this week where I was convicted by the Holy Spirit. Now, let me be very clear on something. The Holy Spirit doesn't condemn us. He doesn't bring things to our attention to push us down and to distance us from God. He brings things to our attention so that we can make changes in cooperation with him so we become more Christ-like. I had two experiences this week where inside, I didn't do anything externally to mistreat people, but inside, I just didn't like some things that I saw. And I thought to myself, here I'm preaching this message, and there was a group of people who were just, just irking me. And I thought, I, I can remember, I was at a, I was at a, a a restaurant, a little fast food place, and I was filling my cup up with diet root beer, and I thought, Adam, Adam. And I literally said, you know, I'm going to walk back to my table, and I'm going to have a better attitude about this group of people, because it's just not right. That's not right. I'm not treating them the right way. I need to smile. And so I smiled. In fact, somebody looked at me like, you're not one of us. And I was just like, <laughs> no, I, I didn't do that. I wasn't weird, but I did smile. You know what? That was good for my heart. You can say, Adam, oh, that's such a small thing. That small thing can be a big thing real quick. So how are you treating people these days? In the words of Jesus, he said, by this, people will know you're my disciples by the way you love one another. Are you more loving? Would people characterize you as one of the most loving people they know, merciful, grace-giving? You know, when people think about our church and think about people of Pathways, they say, those people are merciful. They love well. They do it right. James puts it this way. If you drop down in the last part of this section of Scripture in verse 13, he says, mercy triumphs over judgment. And remember James, who James is, he's a half-brother of Jesus. I can't help but think when he was writing this little letter, he's thinking to himself, man, I remember when my brother gave that sermon called the Sermon on the Mount. I remember when he was up there and he said these words, hear the words of Jesus, blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy. Isn't it interesting how all of us, when we mess up, we want mercy, but when somebody else messes up, we want to quickly judge them and say, you know what? They don't deserve it. They were too lazy. They didn't prioritize their time. When we miss a deadline, it's because we were over busy. When they miss a deadline, it's because they didn't prioritize well. When, 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 we, break the, when we break the rules, we're innovative. When they break the rules, they're rebellious. We want mercy, but we're not willing to give it. Isn't that interesting? And what does Jesus say? Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown what? It seems to me that Jesus is making a direct correlation as to what we give is what we get. Woo. If you're light on mercy, be careful. Question number three. Do you consistently show mercy to other people in your life? Are you somebody who plays favorites or discriminates or you deny mercy? You know, I think these are questions that all of us can consider. I think that this gets us beyond our actions when it comes to a message like this, and it gets us into our hearts. And we say, God, help me. I want to make sure that faith is working in here so that it goes to work out here because I want to be the kind of individual. We want to be the kind of community that demonstrates the heart of God in terms of, of showing people the love and the care and the mercy that we have found in Jesus Christ. Would you bow with me for a word of closing prayer? Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for the truth of your word. Now I pray, God, that you would continue to transform us. Help us to monitor our hearts, to look deep within when it comes to this passage in James. God, forgive us of our wrongdoings, 
the attitudes. And Lord, help us to never show favoritism. God, that we would put a stop to that, regardless of how we were raised or some of the cultural norms of our day. Lord, when we try to get pressed into a mold or a, anything that's outside of your word, God, we just want to do your word. So help us. We love you and we pray this in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our risen Savior. And everyone who agreed this prayer said, Amen. Amen.